All right. So for today, we have an interview with my friend, my brother, my guide, Aramana Sewell. And he's here because I get to pick his brain on ceremonial magic. So if you could maybe, I don't know, do you want to do a little intro of yourself, even though you've been on my channel before or something? Uh, hello and welcome to all of you, to each and every single one of you out there from Magicology. The Black Tower welcomes you. You come to my living room. We'll hang out. We'll have coffee. It's going to be a great time. I'll be <laughs> too, too. I just made some of that. No. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. You're going to be picking my brain. I ain't got much left up there. And it's full of stuff and stuff. Well, but let's pull out of it what we can. Yep. Year, so you have a lot of years of experience, like, with magic in general and, you know, doing all sorts of things. You took a different angle on things than I did. And um, so, you know, I've been stepping into making this ceremonial magic playlist. And, oh. you know, I like, to, I like to brainstorm with people that know things uh, differently or know a, a more or less sometimes than I do. Th this is not the latter case. Um, I don't know if you're using sweetened butter or goat butter, but this is good butter. <laughs> it's the ego, huh? Okay, you want to know what you want to know? I help you. <laughs> so, what is ceremonial magic to you? Well, first off, thank you very much for having me on here. Uh, second off, ceremonial magic is uh, physical actions where you're literally getting up, standing up, you know, where you're doing your thing. Uh, and like you go to each quarter and you call the quarters. Uh, it's no different than in witchcraft or anything else. The difference is, is that in ceremonial magic, uh, you have to put yourself into the mindset of a uh, magician or a practitioner who stands between the worlds. Uh, a lot of this is sometimes covered uh, when they, in witchcraft, for example, they, they talk a lot about uh, being a nexus of power, uh, being at the crossroads, you know, things of this nature. Well, a ceremonial magician already has it in his or her mind that they are the center of the universe, that they are the center of creation. And from them comes all things and all things come back to it. And so when they put on their ceremonial garb, whether, you know, it's robes, whether it's robes and hoods, uh, whether it's a myriad of rings, jewelry, you know, just anything, anything that they're going to be needing uh, to accentuate and to pull more power from during their rites. And then what they'll do is it's no different than a, than just say a, a, a regular ritual. It's just called ceremonial because it's, it's, it comes from a standpoint of you're doing a religious act, uh, except it's uh, religious in the sense, not as like a church would be religious, like a religion, not that kind of religious but a kind of religious of representing that you yourself are a representative of God, of the creator, of goddess, of, you know, of all this. And so you see yourself as that power that created all things. And this is the most important thing behind uh, ceremonial magic is it comes with the mindset uh, that you create and destroy all things, that you are the creator destroyer. You know, you are this magnificent being uh, but you approach it with a stance of humility, and it's often hard to explain to people. Uh, it's easy for it to go to your head, for your ego to become overinflated, so forth and so on. And so the idea is to approach it with humility in your heart. You know, though you have the power to create or destroy, you're not there to create or destroy at a whim or at a fancy. You're there to create or destroy by, by desire. So it's that whole oh, design by desire. Uh, and then the rest of it is just knowing, uh, you know, what system you're going to work with. Huh. I'm wrapping my brain around all of, all of that. Because, um, you know, one of the things that you touched on is, you know, it's, it, it, that it's, not, it's not an impulsive thing to engage in, is it? I mean, I, I think... Okay. That, say it again? Actually, sometimes... Uh, like I myself, I've uh, 
than sitting there for like days needing something or want something or, you know, just all of a sudden something comes up and I'm like, holy shit, I got to break out some big guns for this, you know, like, cause all of a sudden something can just happen out of nowhere, like a bill that's like a hundred dollars more than what you can afford. And all of a sudden you're like, oh shit. Well, everybody's had that feeling, right? I mean, you, I'm sure you've had that feeling before. Yeah. What is the very first thing you go to? First things, normally, people look at, oh, well, where can I rob Peter and pay Paul from? You know, they're trying to figure out how they can balance their bills and stuff. Well, for the magic minded, they, they, they may think this, but they're also sitting there going in the back of their head, what can magic actually do for me? What, you know, who could I call upon? What would work? Well, a ceremonial magician has one step up that most practitioners don't have. They see themselves as the center of the universe, like I was talking about. And so automatically they're like, hmm, I could use Enochian magic for this. I could use, uh, I could use uh, Golden Dawn styled uh, spear workings from the Tree of Life. Myriads of things that, you know, because uh, in, in ceremonial magic and high magic in general, people get stuck and they think, that high magic is, oh, that's Golden Dawn. Oh, that's the Lima. Uh, stuff of this nature. A uh, ceremonial magician does high magic. That's what it's called. But high magic isn't to be misunderstood as, you know, like it's a greater magic than low magic. Because this happens a lot in the psyche. This is the way people look at it. For some reason, I have no idea why. You know, like, Oh yeah, that's where you get dressed up and you go chanting and lighting candles and incense. I'm like, you do that low witchcraft too. Yep. High magicians, instead of calling upon forces outside of themselves to create what they're wanting, high magicians stand there and say, they say the words of power to create their desire. They've sat there and they've drawn a sigil that is absolutely going to create the outcome that they're desiring doesn't matter what the moon phase is in, don't matter what day of the week, anything like that, because that's trivial. Because all you have to do is if it's in the wrong moon sign, all you got to do is find out what's the opposite. Well, if I can't draw it to me because the moon's waning, all I can do is cast away. What can I cast away? I can cast away the blockage. Huh. And this works in, in all forms of magic, period, in the story. But a ceremonial magician is wired this way. Uh, in high magic, they're wired this way. They're just like, you know, nothing. Once you start to learn the basics and you understand how it works, the rest of it's just up to your imagination. You know, how far can you take this? What can you do with it? What are you capable of doing? What powers can you actually uh, uh, control? Can you actually, you know, bend to your desire, your will to work your will? Um, and so in a sense, coming back to the, hundred dollar bill over that you need for your money well how magician is going to be thinking about you know well such and such is going into retrograde we're too far away from saturn or you know that they, they take into account all these different planetary things now mind you it doesn't stop then they just learn how to work around it well let's take into an example saturn saturn is all about restrictiveness okay yeah. <clears throat> Saturn isn't just about restrictive and death and decay and all this. Uh, Saturn sets the boundaries for what can be, for what is allowed. Well, you can work with the elements of, with the planet of Saturn, and you can be like, you know, open the way. And this is what a lot of people, don't, they don't think about when they're working with these really tight, hard to work with powers and forces, is that you have to say the way is open. Opened is the way. Because it's all about you decreeing the words and saying it is this way. A lot of people, they save that for after the right. They go, you know, at the end, uh, may my will be done, you know. <clears throat> or as above, so below, whatever closing, they give it, you know, to close it off. But the importance to any kind of right, not just with Saturn, but any of them, is to declare the way is open. Uh, and, and there's small tips and tricks that you can use. Uh, and I'm using Saturn as an example. Well, of course, you're going to want Saturn to quit being the, the tight disciplinarian that says, no, you can't have that. Because uh, you got to think the sun and Saturn, they're, they're one and the same. They're hand in hand, basically. Okay, because Saturn is a circle. 
the circle of the dot in the center of it is the symbol of the sun. Whereas you as the as a ceremonial magician, as a high magician, whatever, you step into the center, you become the sun. You become the the infinite power. And and you're sitting there and you're it's like you're communicating with your dark evil twin, going, Hey, look here. We gotta work together. You know, we're going to work together. I'm all about some restrictive and keeping everything in order and keep it balanced. But I need this to be let through. And so a ceremonial magician would know this. They would open up, they, they would do an opening by the four watchtowers. Nothing different than earth, air, water, fire, you know. Uh, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, I'm going a little hoarse. But anyway, so you would do the opening by the four watchtowers because what you need is you need witnesses. So the difference between high magic and low magic is the fact that you may call the four quarters, but they're called an elemental quarter. Uh, now I've heard them, you know, in certain aspects, they'll call upon the Lord and the lady of each quarter or something like that. You know, there's, there's as many different ways as possible, but in high magic, as it affects ceremonial magic, they're calling upon the, uh, the power of the watchtower itself, which represents the elements, the spirits, the lords and ladies, the gods and goddesses, everything that comp that, that, that is composed within that element. And they're saying, stand ye, and be witness unto this my right, you know, uh, and you do this because you want their energy and you want their power. And when you ask them to stand witness, what's happening is they're lending their strength and their aid to what the magician is working. And then when you've done all four of the quarters, you know, in the order, uh, because that, like I said, there's so many different rules. Like you know, when do you do it? When do you start in the north? When do you start in the east? You know, so yep. forth and so on. But it's all based on what you're trying to if you're, what you're trying to manifest. If you're trying to manifest something upon this plane, you're going to want to begin and end in the north. That's yep. just all there is to it, you know. Uh, but it's no different than crafting a spell that you're going to, you know, light a candle and some incense and try to get something to manifest. Uh, so in ceremonial magic, you know, you, you're just keeping up with the rules and how it works. And then as you go to then as you go to make the calling and do everything, then you sit there. You've got them as witnesses. You're sitting there and you've got your Sagam Day of Meth if you're doing any no kin. You've got your just uh, six point star if you're do or if you're doing um, <coughs> Golden Dawn or Thelemic style workings, which just represents Earth and the manifestation upon this plane. Because you've run through all the planes as you're doing the work. Like I said, no different than any other system. And then you're sitting there and you set your sigil on top of it. And you sit there and you're like, um, uh, the rays fill mine eye. And then, and, the, and that, that um, ha is the breathing in of that God power of creation, the masculine and feminine. And you're pulling it in. And the whole time you've had your eyes closed when you're doing that, when you open your eyes and you say, the rays fill mine eyes. What you're saying is that the power is within and it is, it is being released. And then you look straight at the seal or sigil. And this is where it differs a lot from low magic. In low magic, they have you visualize most strongly. In high magic, you want the mind clear. The only thing, the symbol has been made. The, si the sigil represents what it represents. You've already done that when you created it. Yep. You're visualizing what you wanted it to do. But in ritual, <laughs> instead of revisualizing all that, because it's a double negative, you're like saying, well, no, I didn't do it right the first time. Mm. So I'm to do this, all you're doing is keeping the mind clear and you're feeding it nothing but power by gazing upon it intently and strongly. And of course, you have hand gestures, you know, like the V or the hand stretched out, even stretched out like this, it doesn't matter. I even do it like this right here. And let my eyes look between like a single beam, like the eye of the triangle, over the sigil. And you're sitting there, and all you're doing is pushing energy out your eyes into it. No thought, just pure just pure power. You're feeling it flow and wrap through you and come out your eyes. And you're empowering it. And then, while your mind's clear, see it become a thing on the astral plane, just glowing with power until it dissipates. And when you see it flash and dissipate like you took a lighter to it and burnt it, burnt it to ashes, 
that's how you know that your intent was made manifest upon the plane. Yeah, for for me, when I've activated <clears throat> sigils in in that way, um, when I'm like just you know after I do the construction and pouring the intent in, into them, especially when I'm designing them, um, because I I you know like in one of my videos on um you know um phrasing your intention, I come up with that one rep repetitive phrase because you know repeating things does help to oomph yep. it. Repetition, and, repetition, repetition. Yep. And when I'm gazing at it, pouring the power into it, it I see I see something either with my eyes or my mind's eye that indicates that it's um you know it's like it's like when you fill a car with gas and you get that click because it can't take any more gas. Yeah, it makes you feel oh, oh you, you feel safe all of a sudden all of a sudden you know it's been done it's good. Yep. And what what was I trying to think with the other with one of the other questions was um. You know, like you're talking about the difference between the high magic and the low magic, and it's it's interesting to note that the um, because this is the basis of my channel to begin with, that um, like the Necronomicon spellbook, with this with the way that you program and work with the 15 names of Marduk with the sigils is you know visualizing, gazing at the sigil, yeah, chanting, visualizing again, while you're gazing at the sigil, and then chanting again. So, and then you step into the gate walking, which is more of a ceremonial magic thing because you got all like anybody see my got all the giant list of tools, right? Um, you know, one of the things that like when you were talking was, um, you know, when you're working with various spirits, if you're the center of if you're the center of your universe, when you are doing ceremonial magic and stuff, when you call upon another entity or or like being for help if it's from one of the watchtowers or whatever pantheon you're working with um are you supposed to see yourself as higher than them or equal to them when you ask for their help or even lower than they I are i was hoping that's where you were going uh no you have to remember this uh all powers that exist in the universe and creation itself and even in the void exist within us okay yeah. This does not make us their Lord and Master and they have to obey. It means the same thing that they're made out of, we're made out of. The same things they can do, we can do. Yep. No, you very much have to respect them as if they are intelligent external beings. And this is very hard to explain because uh, even on my path of sorcery, uh, of, uh, of apotheosis, of being the God that I am versus bowing and worshiping other gods and all this other stuff, it gets a little tricky sometimes the way you have to approach this. Uh, so you see them as external, but realize that they they exist externally, but the mask or form that they're taking is one that has been created subconsciously within us. Yep. And maybe even developed over thousands and thousands of years because of the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. You know, but their essence and their and their true intelligence still remain. But, but all you've done is tapped into their primal energies through ritual, pulled them out of the depths, and all they've done is they've tinkered around in your head till they found, okay, I need to approach this one with this mask. Or maybe you've given them a mask, or, you know, if you're using the Simon Necronomicon, the mask is already ready for them to wear. So yep. You call it that way. <laughs> Sorry, dude, I don't know why I'm coughing my head off. Anyway, it's not from smoke. It's I don't know, it's phlegm and stuff. But anyway, so when I call them, I very much respect them for who and what they are because whether or not you whether or not you think that you're more than they are, you gotta understand they're the intangible. And you're tangible. Yep. It is a lot easier for them to fuck your shit up than it is for you to fuck their shit up. Yep. And the reason why is because you know, they're in a plan that's like there's very few that know how to, you know, actually, honestly, be a threat to them. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's always good to come out with the respect of, you know, that these are living, actual beings. But at the same time, you have to realize that what you're interacting with, like I said, is just a mask that's been formed over how many thousands of years uh, or decades or whatever. Uh, and that that's what you're calling forth is that primal power using the mask that you're that you're giving them to wear. 
It kind of gives them guidelines by which they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do, basically. You know, it's it's interesting because I remember um, I have this uh, God, what's the name of it? It's buried behind some of my books back there, but it's like um, it, it's a it it's a goetic invocation workbook number two, I think. And um, one of the things that it says when when it's going about summoning is you know like appear in a comely appearance or something like that. Basically, appear before me in a comely appearance. There yeah. you go. Yep. So you know, because that's almost like programming the, hey, use me as an antenna and, and, and come through in a form that I'm going to understand. Yeah, because three things are happening at once, no matter what kind of calling you're doing. First off, you're bypassing your consciousness. You're using your consciousness to tap into your subconscious to awaken these powers. Yep. Well, somewhere far, far away and deep, deep within, these things are being stirred. The waters are being disturbed. And they're rising from the depths. Okay, that's the first thing that's happening. Second thing that's happening is that then you're trying to communicate to them the best way you can, you know, what you need, what you're wanting, you know, whether to appear in a friendly form, whether to, you know, uh, come across intelligible so you can understand what they're saying, uh, so forth and so on. And, and this, that, that's the second part. The third part is, comes right back to when you were asking, how do you view them? You know, how do you look at them? You know, do you roll over them or, you know, things like that. The third part is when they actually get there. When they actually get there, then comes the hard part. Then comes the part of, you know, you have to stand there and you have to be so sure in yourself and in your abilities and stuff. Not necessarily that you can make it go away or anything like that, but you have to be, you have to know your center of power. And that way, when you call them and they're there, they recognize this energetically and automatically there's a respect there. Yeah. And you've got to maintain that respect the entire time you're working, you know, and that's an asking, not commanding. Yeah. Uh, now, there are some beings that the only way they'll do anything for you is to be commanded. But that's a real slippery slope that you have to be really careful with. Because, uh, like, for example, in a lot of high magic books and stuff like this, they, you know, even the early Goetia, you know, they're sitting there, you know, throwing the names of God. You know, oh, you'll burn in a torment in hell if you don't show up and be nice to me and stuff. Yep. You know, there was all this really weird, archaic wording by, by the fearful religious people. And I'm like, well, if you're fearful and you're religious, you really shouldn't be messing with these guys because they're going to screw you up. Yeah. You know, but all in all, you know, when you let all that go and you allow them to show you who and what they are, nine times out of ten, they're very friendly to the person who called them, some of them. You know, but the more you start playing in that pool, the more you have to be aware of you're not always going to get that experience. Sometimes there are low bottom feeders they come in and mimic the effects and the abilities of these of these powerful beings. And they'll pretend all day long that they are that being. And if you don't know the difference, you're not sensitive to their energies or can pick up on it, they can fool you. And you're feeding them. And they're not doing a damn thing for you. You know, but sometimes that happens. Like I said, that's the slippery slope. You know, but when you start to question something like that, then then comes the point where you have to sit there and say, when you command them into like a triangle or something like that, and it's a questionable thing, you know, you have to be like forceful, but respectful at the same time. You have to be like, you know, answer truthfully. Are you such and such? Tell me that you are. Yeah, there's, um, there, there's this, uh, I, I think it was in that same book where you have like this book of signatures, right? Um, where you, when the, when the entity is summoned, it's basically giving them a way to sign their signature. So you kind of, so it's, it's like showing your license when you're going to, when you're going through an airport, you know, confirming that it's confirming that it's you. Yeah. And you know, so I thought that was, I thought that was rather interesting. I mean, one, one thing, cause uh, you know, we did talk about that for, for a bit is um, does ceremonial magic always involve working with a, a, a other plant, like a being from another plane 
or can it just solely be you and your own power? Like for people that are like a little too spooked to invoke something into their house. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, well, let's break this out real then. Uh, back years ago, I wanted to uh, start working magic that did not involve using the names of beings or spirits or invoking them. I wanted to pull the power from myself to create it my, on my own. Uh, not because I was spooked or anything, but because I was just like, you know, it's fine to call upon a spirit and ask them to teach you something or show you something or explain something to you. Yep. It's something else to call upon something and ask to help manifest something in your life. But there comes a point where you have to fucking do it yourself. Yeah. You know, like going out and putting in applications, making calls, doing stuff like that. It just comes in hand with it. But I got kind of interested in that. So I would, you know, I would sit there and I'd be like, well, you can't leave out the watchtowers because they represent power. But as you call them, feel that energy and that power and let it build up in your, in your what they call your energy body. And then go to the next one and do the same until that energy is built up. And then mix those two. Go to the third, feel it, mix it. Go to the fourth, feel it, mix it, mix it energetically, okay? Yep. You don't have to have names of anything to do this. Now then, you are you are infused with the power of the great below, the great between, and the great above of each of the elements. Not just the elements, but the spirits and gods and guardians and stuff of those quarters. You can even do this with cross borders too. And uh, which we won't get into it, but that's the secret between the four and the eight on the uh, using the mandalas that we talked about. Yeah, that's one of the secrets of it. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, with that, then you're standing there and you have all this power. Now then, as you stood there in the center, you've claimed yourself to be the center of all things and you've claimed these powers and things. Now, one of the things I would have done way before I did all this was create a ritual where you sit there and you create a chant, uh, create a, uh, a, a, a seal or sigil, if you plan on creating a familiar spirit that's going to protect you or going to guard over something or going to bring this to you, you know, like a servant spirit, uh, Tolpo, you know, whatever, you would use the idea of ceremonial magic to create the magical space in which you can do all, any and all working. Because that's the secret of the, uh, the magician card of the tarot. One is force, twain is powers. You know, that's what Crowley was talking about, you know. Uh, you are that center power, and you're working with, you know, polar opposites, first off, but then you're messing with the four elements, you know, and, and all that entails, and then so much more. And all you're doing is, it's, it's easy to invoke these elements without actually having to call upon the names of beings to sit there and say, power, forces, gods, guardians, and keepers of the such and such gate. Hear me. Feel me now with thy essence and thy power and thy might, that I might stand worthy during the workings of my magic. And you would do this at each one, you know, putting in, you know, east, west, north, south, whatever. You know, that's just, it's, it's easy to do that. It's, you know, you've just got to, you got to think outside the box and you can't be held back by the way other people do it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I mean, you know, there's so many traditions that are around um, ceremonial magic. And I know that they, like, the, the one thing that kind of turned me off from the Golden Dawn was its, you know, Judeo-Christian kind of flavoring there, um, given my own background with things. So, I mean, I'll take my foot off my soapbox because it was literally on there. Um, but it's just for people that, like, if they don't want to follow a tradition in terms of ceremonial magic, what advice would you have for someone that wants to step into that role of being able to create their own universe in this kind of way without adopting something like Thelema or uh Okay. Well, this is the something. hardest. This is the hardest uh, area in high magic to master to work with. And that's Enochian. Uh, in Enochian, uh, just at the beginning of every single key, also not that of Saji. I reign over you, say the Lord of Hosts. Mm. Just at the beginning of every key. 
Now let's take for example it was you doing this. Okay, you're just quote you're just quote you're reading it off in this archaic tongue. Hell, you might even have the English translation and read it off by that because you can't pronounce the words, right? Yeah. The whole time you're doing this, you're wondering which Lord of the universe, who, who, what highest one, blah blah blah. All this stuff's gonna be going through your head subconsciously. But in that instance, you have to recognize that you are the center of the universe. You are that creator and destroyer. You are the Lord of hosts. And the same thing goes in Golden Dawn. Now, in the Golden Dawn, they like to use a lot of Egyptian uh, god forms, like Anubis, Astar, uh, Isis. Wow, so I must mess that up. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Ampu, Doth. All that, you know, you got all these different beings, and now the Golden Dawn. Now, at least they did give us that. Okay, they kept us away from that. But also at the same time, they also have God names like Jehovah, uh, Elohim, yeah, uh, so forth and so on. When I've always said, like in my videos, where I'm like, you know, you have to redefine what these words mean. Uh, find out, like, for example, IHVH, four-letter name of God, the Tetragrammaton, okay? Yep. First off, if you haven't already figured out that you're God, something's bad off, you're going to miss this. Second off, IHVH is the four elements combined. Huh. Now, where'd you get that from? Seriously? 23, 24 years of practice, meditation, study, and working, brother. <laughs> This is why I'm asking you these questions. <laughs> oh my goodness, man, dude. There's, you know, some of it can be found in books. Some of it can't. Yeah. IHBH. Uh, it represents uh, the body of Adam, A-D-A-M, as in the biblical Adam. Yep. IHBH is the spiritual name of Adam. Huh. And we're Adam. Yep. Okay. And if you're a female and you're watching this, you're Eve too, but you're also Adam in this sense. You're the IHVH. You are the four elements combined. That's what made us. Those are the building blocks of creation. Those those four letters, those four sounds. Now, this is the spiritual body. You take the tree of life, throw it right up there. Not only have you got, not only have you got the cube that this fits in, the square that it fits in, but the tree of life is the body. The top three, Sephora, and you and I have talked about this. It is the crown. Yep. Understanding and wisdom. May I be crowned by eternity forever. This is your power. You've got to claim it. You've got to bring that crown down and place it upon your head. But you raise up uh, mentally, astrally, to where your body is made up of the planets and the stars until above you, until below you, your feet rest upon the earth. And you are this. You are this God being, rich above you. Take the crown and place it down upon your head. Crowned by eternity, I am eternal. And snap out of it. You know, most people, they try to, oh, well, you gotta come down out of your meditation. No, open your fucking eyes, snap out of it. That power is, you are that power, that power is embraced. Now this is chaotic as fuck. But that's why they tell you to do the Kabbalistic cross, the Altar, Makut, Begevara, Begetua, Le'alam, amen. You know, thou art the, thou art the, uh, thou art the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Thou art, I am. That's ah. who, that's who ah. thou is. Thou is you. Thou is me. Thou is whoever's doing this. You're claiming Godhood. Yep. You're claiming this power. And so the Kabbalist across us, what it's for is to infer upon you the power of the creator destroyer and then when you take the body of adam cadman you then become the father and the son when that power fills you then you are the shekinah then you have the divine you, you know the the father the son and the holy ghost the holy ghost is the gnosis the wisdom that comes from having done these workings it is the feminine aspect huh. and that's how that ties in these are the things that ceremonial magicians and is taught in high math and these are the things that's, that takes years to learn because it's one thing for me to sit here and tell somebody this stuff yep so they do the workings themselves 
until they've done the research and seen it with their own two eyes. They're not going to understand. They're going to understand to a degree. But until they take up the mantle and decide, oh, I'm going to do this, and then they start to understand energetically while they're doing it. Holy crap, that's what he was talking about. You know, and that's why it's so difficult to teach ceremonial magic or high magic in general is because it's also left up. Uh, opinion is varied and everybody's truth is different from another person's truth. But at the same time, all truths are the same truth and they are the truth. They're just your truth, my truth, somebody else's truth. You know? That goes then, along with how magic is very experiential and, and individual. Yeah. So, like, high magic could vary to, from one person to, to the other. Yeah. But, um, so I got, like, I'm thinking, like, I'm thinking I got, like, especially just to hit all the good points, I got, like, two more questions for you. Well, so, let me finish something real quick, if you can yep. remember your questions. Okay, so... A year and a half ago, I was telling you, well, yeah, it was about a year and a half, almost two years ago, I told you that I had finished the grade of uh, Hierophant in the Golden Dawn system. The Hierophant uh, tells the truth through lies, through deception. Huh. And part of that was the whole knowing that one truth is the same truth, is the truth, and somebody else can have a separate truth and it still be truth too. Multi-possible gem. That's why it's so important to go through the grade systems because each one has an element, a, a, a secret, a gnosis that's unlocked through doing it. And then when you progress through the grades and stages and taking your time and done it, not just rush through it because you want to become, you know, uh, Darth Sidious of the universe or some shit, <laughs> or whatever you can come up with, you know, because the true power comes in time. You just, you got to develop it. You got to cultivate it. You got to grow it. I'm ready to hear these questions. Well, because, you know, you kind of might have touched on it a little bit here and there, but how long do, what does it take someone, do you think, to get effective at ceremonial magic? You know, I mean, I know that there's like learning a system or developing one, given your background and whatnot, um, but, you know, practicing with it and getting into that right mindset does it do you think it would take someone a long time to be effective at ceremonial magic no uh, i'll be honest with you uh with the rate that people people progress and learn uh a year to two max and that's even for some of the most hardcore don't know what they doing <laughs> you know what i'm saying and but that also means that they have to have a they have to have friends that can, you know, answer questions for them or, you know, some kind of way of, you know, somebody that will communicate with them and give them tips or advice or if they've got questions that will help answer, you know. But no, one to two years, seriously. And no, you're not going to be a master of it, but you'll be well enough on your way that basically nobody's going to sit and babys babysit you. They ain't, they ain't going to be too many questions come up unless you have, like, a really weird vision and you're like, how does that equate to this sphere I'm working with? You know, and it may not be that sphere. It might be the sphere above beckoning you to come on. <laughs> but see, it's stuff like that. That's why you take experienced practitioners to help answer the questions of those coming up in the systems. Mm -hmm. And um, the other <laughs> one is, are there any dangers with ceremonial magic? Because, you know, yeah, every, literally everything today has a warning label. And if it doesn't, it should. Uh, I'm going to say, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's not quite as severe as a lot of people would want to think. The, uh, the dangers inherent in it is that uh, the Kabbalistic cross, it is there for a reason, okay? It makes you a six-point axis. You're a straight line, you're a sideways line, and then there's a line going from the center of your chest behind you, before you. And dead center of that, the universe moves around you. So, you know, so it's like a 3D rotating thing. So it's like a, it's a, it's a living cross. Uh, that's why when they say, you know, uh, uh, well, I'm not even going to go into that because it's too archaic and wouldn't fit here. But anyway, 
they, they have so many different sayings and so many phrases that fits in places, but unless you know the language or anything like that, it just, it works to confuse rather than, than help. Yep. But, uh, you want to do that before all workings and you want to do that afterwards because what it does is it centers your, it centers your aura. It centers your body's energies. It balances you. So you want to start off doing the Kabbalist across. And then you can do the body of Adam Cadman, just visualizing yourself growing taller than the universe, you know, where everything is made up in your astral form. I remember that one. Yeah, and up near the top, there's going to be nothing but just dark space and stuff up near your head and stuff, you know. And, you know, and then you reach up and you, you, you grab, you know, they show it like a triangle. But when you go to take it, 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 it literally a force, you can feel it as you're pulling it down over your head. It is a crown, you know, and it is your, it is your godhood. It is your authority. It is your rulership, your right to rule, uh, you know, stuff like that. And so you would take this before you start doing the ritual, because in high magic, you have to remember one important lesson. Humility begins when you understand that you are the creator, destroyer, God, for lack of better words. When you realize that you are God, then you have only one thing, and this is, hum this is the humbling effect. And it's not really humbling, but it's something to keep you balanced. If you're God and you fail, who the fuck's going to catch you? Ah. Nobody. Mm -hmm. So you better approach it with humility because you're, you're like a kid playing with powers. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. It's like a three-year-old picks up mama's little 38 snub nose, shoots sister in the head because he didn't know it wasn't a toy. Yep. He knew that his little hand grabbed it. I mean, it happened. Uh, you know, stuff like that. So you want to approach it with respect and humility, you know, especially until you get a good hang of it. And even somebody who's messed with it for 23, 24 years, there are some rights that when I go to do them, man, I have to make damn sure I'm in the right mindset that I'm in good enough health for it. Because just any little thing offset it, and it can totally offset the result. I can cause shit to go to hell instead of put it together like I need it to. Yep. So the sound mind and body, they're not lying about that. That's stick with that. You're going to need it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, was, I, was, I just had a different, a different idea, but that's because my mind goes all over the place. But, um, you know, so I think we did cover quite a, quite a few things here, but because, you know, this would be, I think the second interview that I've had with you on my, on my channel, because you're more of the, is it number three? All right. Third time's the charm. Way to forget that. Nice job. Pretty um, certain was I had you on mine and that's how it's story. Oh, so we're bouncing back and forth then. But okay. for those, <clears throat> for anyone that has, that has just found the channel, um, why don't you tell them a little bit about your channel? Cause I'm going to put a link in the description down there. Okay. Uh, I'm the Sorcerer on my soul. My channel's name is the black tower on YouTube. Uh, just the black tower and then Necronomicon and you'll see my beautiful key. Please, please there. Uh, that's me. My channel was created for, uh, all things Necronomicon going completely in depth with understanding it, breaking it down, how to do the rites, how to do the rituals which I'm really, I'm really kind of behind in that because uh, about middle of last year, I got a little carried away and started doing interviews. Uh, so I have to come back to fixing that, getting back to doing more of those. Uh, but in it, you're going to find that I try my best to break down the Simon Necronomicon. Uh, I do my, my best to show how it's not enough to be uh, religious in any sense, but how to do it out, outside of a religious setting, because that book is so confusing about like, oh, you're a priest of this and that. Well, in this day and age, when we think priest, we think religion. Yep. So I come from it from a sorcerer point of view. And, uh, and I try to show them how to do that. Also, there's some other onion really weird shit that I just like to throw out there every now and then. But, uh, Basically, it's just, you know, it's working in our uh, magical occult community of just trying to bring people together, uh, show all these different systems and things while staying true to my heart, which is in the Simon Necronomicon. Everything I learned about magic was so that I could understand exactly how to work the magic in this book. 
And I got to say, 23, 24 years later, not bored, never grew bored. <laughs> that is the central flame. That's a, that's a really, really good explanation of your channel. You're going to have to type all that up and put it in your description, I think. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so I'm trying to think of how to tie in what I say and what you say at the, be at the ending of our videos. So I'm gonna let you start with your send off there. Until next time, peace, blessings, and power. And good hunting. Thanks for watching my video. So if you wanna check out my playlists, I have, among others, the Simon Necronomicon, The Tree of Life, General Magic, Tulpamancy, a playlist on my books, The Elements, Stones, The Theories That Govern Magic, and the gods and goddesses of Mesopotamia. If you want to check out my books on Amazon, I have Creating Consciousness, Magical Mechanics, Magical Theater, Handy Sigil Magic, and The Guide to the Spheres and Beyond. You can also find me on Facebook at MagicologyYT. You can email me at priestofthenecro at gmail.com, and you can even check out my Instagram, which is Magicology. And good hunting.